Okay, welcome to lesson 2.8. This is our second week of linear programming, so it is linear programming continued. Remember that our objective and purpose for linear programming is to ultimately optimize some objective function, like for example, profit. Some of the necessary skills that you'll need in order to be successful in this lesson is you need to be able to graph and find the solution area to a system of linear inequalities. And if you are not comfortable with that, make sure you go back to the prior week, review the lesson, and review the practice. You must also be able to locate vertices for a feasible region. And that's what we did last week as well. And finally, we substituted vertice points into the objective function to maximize and minimize. Those are the three necessary skills that you need to bring into this lesson and then the practice that follows. Let's remind ourselves what the steps are. So number one, we need to write the set of constraints as a system of linear inequalities, and that's what we'll be practicing today. We'll be writing constraints. We'll be writing linear inequalities. Number two, we need to then graph the constraints, which you've already done, but we'll be doing that today. And then three, shade, find the solution area. Again, a skill that you've already mastered, hopefully last week. Four, identify the xy points or the vertices in the solution area and we did practice on that last week as well. Five, write the objective function. I won't be requiring you to write the objective function. I'm going to give you the verbiage, but then I will actually have the objective fun function written out for you. And then six, plug each xy point into the objective function to determine which point maximizes or minimizes our objective. And we will be doing that as well today, but you also did that last week. Okay, let's do our first example. So in our first example, we are going to write the set of constraints as a system of linear inequalities. And that's all we're going to do for our first problem. We're gonna start small. So here's our scenario. A potter is making cups and plates. It takes her six minutes to make a cup and three minutes to make a plate. Each cup uses three quarters of a pound of clay and each plate uses one pound of clay. She has 20 hours available for making the cups and plates and has 250 pounds of clay on hand. Seems like a lot of information, but we can break it down. So first thing we need to know is that there are two products here, cups and plates. So we need to define our variables prior to writing constraints. So let's go ahead and do that first. So we'll say, and I'll just call those X and Y because it'll be easier to graph if we use X's and Y's. And we won't be graphing this one, but as we move forward, it'll be easier to graph. So let's call X the number of plates and we'll call Y the number of, well actually let's call X the number of cups since that comes first. And let's call Y the number of plates. And it doesn't actually matter which one, but it'll just help me to keep it organized. So we've defined our variables, now we need to go through and we need to write a set of, com of constraints. So we need to analyze this text for the information that's important. So it says that it takes her six minutes to make a cup and three minutes to make a plate. So we're dealing with time. If we're dealing with time, then we, do, we don't need pounds of clay. That's not the same unit. So let's look through this problem and see what other time we have. And it says that she has 20 hours available for making the cups and the plates. So this is going to be one equation, an equation with time. And this is a constraint. She has 20 hours available. That means she does not have 21, but she does have 19. So we're going to use this information in order to write a constraint. So let's go ahead and write our first constraint. Number one. In this situation, she has six minutes to make a cup. So that means that each cup, and we defined the cups as X, right? Number of cups. So each cup takes six minutes. And if we add that to how long it takes her to do plates, it takes her three minutes to do each plate. So six minutes times each cup she does plus three minutes times each plate will give us the total time she spends working. And we know that the total time she spends working cannot be greater than the 20 hours right here that's available. Okay, but we have to be careful of our units. These are in minutes, and this is in hours. 
So how many minutes is 20 hours? Well, we know that there is 60 minutes in every hour. So if we multiply 60 by 20, we get 1200 minutes. So we would just need to make sure that if we had minutes here, that we would need to keep it as minutes over here. Okay, so the total time she spends working, think about this, does it need to be less than or equal to what's available or greater than or equal to what's available? And hopefully you said it has to be less than or equal to what's available. That's her time that she has 20 hours or 1200 minutes. That's all she can spend. Okay, so that is our first constraint. Now let's look at the other information we have. Each cup uses three quarters of a pound of clay and each plate uses one pound of clay. If we continue down this problem, it says she has 250 pounds available on hand, right? So that's the most she can use. So again, if we look back at our variables that we defined, x is the number of cups, y is the number of plates, then we can use that to help us write the constraint related to the clay, to the pounds of clay. So each cup uses three quarters, and we can write three quarters as three quarters, or we can divide this out. Three divided by four is 0.75, right? Three quarters out of a dollar is 75 cents. So I'm going to use that. So we have 0.75 pounds of clay per each cup. Okay, so for every cup, we are multiplying by 0.75. And then we need one pound of clay for each plate. And then we know that we have maximum of 250 pounds of clay on hand. So again, what we use has to be less than or equal to what we have on hand. Those are the two constraints for this problem. So we'll go ahead and leave it there for problem one, and as we progress, we'll take these constraints to the next step and we'll graph them, only in a different problem. So let's look at another example. We want to get some practice writing constraints from these problems because that's probably the most difficult part of this is actually writing the constraints. So in this case we're going to write our constraints and then we will go ahead and graph them. So our scenario says a calculator company produces a scientific calculator and a graphing calculator. Right then and there you can say to yourself, okay, here's our two products and we're always looking for the two products. We're looking for the scientific calculator here and we're looking for the graphing calculator. In our last example, we had plates and cups. So we will always know how to define our variables if we look for the products. Okay, so before I continue reading, I can right away just get my X and my Y going. The X will be represent our scientific calculators, so we'll write scientific in here. And then our Y can then represent the graphing calculators. So we have scientific and we have graphing. Okay, now let's continue to read through the problem and figure out where our constraints are located. So our first constraint, let's see. So long-term projects indicate an expected demand of at least, so here we go, anytime you see at least, you should right away be thinking to yourself, that's an inequality. So at least 100 scientific and 80 graphing calculators. Right there, we know we're gonna have a constraint. So that's what we are expected. That is our projections each day. Because of limitations on production capacity, so you can only produce so much, right? Your warehouse can only hold so much or can only produce so much per day. So here again, we have no more than 200 scientific and 170 graphing calculators can be made each day. That's the maximum that our warehouse can produce. But we have a shipping contract and to satisfy it, satisfy it, we need to be able to produce a total of at least 200 calculators. That being said, that would be a combination of scientific and graphing calculators. So in this problem, if we were to continue on and figure out our maximum, we would try to figure out how many scientific versus how many graphing would we want to produce in order to maximize our profits in a day or, or minimize our expenses. But in this example, we'll just go ahead and write our constraints and then we'll practice graphing them. So 
Let's look at our first constraint. So number one, it says that we are, we have an expected demand of at least 100 scientific. So let's deal with that first. X is our scientific, right? So we have X has to be at least, so that means it could be that amount, but it needs to be at least that amount. So X has to be, the scientific calculators have to be at least greater than or equal to 100. So we need to make 100, 101, 102, okay? Now let's look at our second constraint and 80 graphing calculators. So why is our graphing calculators? And that has to be, again, at least 80 graphing calculators. We need to produce at least. So we could produce 81 or 82, but not 79, not 78. Okay, so those two constraints came from at least 100 scientific and graphing calculators each day. So we'll continue to reading. So because of the limitations on our production capacity, no more than 200 scientific and 170 graphing calculators can be made daily. Now this one kind of looks at the other end, right? So this is saying at least 100, but no more than, so our scientific calculators can be no more than 200 though in a day. So our scientific calculators have to be less than or equal to 200. So if you picture a number line, you'd have a line right in the middle between 100 and 200. That's what you can produce in a day. Then it says, and 170 graphing calculators. So same thing, less than or equal to 170 graphing calculators. So this gives us the bottom end and the top end, and we can produce a range between 100 and 200 scientific and between 80 and 170 graphing. So we're almost done reading through here. Now let's look at our last constraint. To satisfy a shipping contract, a total of at least 200 calculators must be shipped each day. Well, and we'll go ahead and label this three and four. In this situation, we're looking at both graphing and scientific. So our fifth constraint says that if we take the scientific and we add it to the graphing, we have to have at least 200 calculators. So we've got the 200 over here this has to be at least, so it has to be greater than or equal to that. That is what at least means. So we have one, two, three, four, five constraints in this problem. Let's go ahead and graph these constraints. And if we're graphing them, these four will be easy to graph, but this fifth one will need to switch to y equals mx plus b form. All right, so I've graphed the constraints for you. But let's go ahead and switch this to y equals mx plus b form so that you can see what I've done. So I subtracted x from each side, and y is now going to be greater than or equal to negative x plus 200. Okay, so these are fairly large numbers. So notice that my scale goes by 50s, 50, 100, 150, 200, both directions for x and y. And I didn't label it, but it would be correct to go ahead and label we said that the X was the scientific calculators, and we said that the Y was our graphing. Okay, so whenever you're doing a graph, it's proper to label each axis as well as have a title. So this is a comparison um, between graphing and scientific calculators. So X is greater than or equal to 100. Okay. What I'm going to do is, in order to graph that, you go along the x-axis, you find 100 right here, and you draw a line through it. Okay, so that is this equation graphed, x equals 100. y is greater than or equal to 80. I would go to where 80 is, approximately right here, put my point, and then I would draw a line right through it. Okay, and that's y equals, 100, equals 80. Then I would graph x is equal to 200. Right now I'm ignoring the inequality because I'm just graphing the boundary lines. So x is equal to 200. I would go over here to where x is equal to 200 and I draw in my line. Okay. So I'm not worried about my shading yet because I'm just graphing the boundary lines. Same with y is less than or equal to 170. I would go to 170, put my point, and draw a line through that. So anything that is x equals will be a vertical line and anything that is y equals will be a horizontal line right through that y point. Finally, we have y is greater than or equal to negative x plus 200. Here's my y-intercept. 
My slope is negative, so notice that my line goes down here in a negative direction. And my slope is negative 1 over 1. Well, that's the same thing as negative 100 over 100, right? Or negative 50 over 50, or negative 10 over 10 as long as it equals 1. So for something like this, it's a lot easier to go down 50, over 50, make a point, down 50, over 50, make a point, et cetera, et cetera, to graph that. If I went by ones, little tiny steps, I would have all the way down, and that would take too long. Now we'll worry about the graphing. So in this first one, this purple one, we have x is greater than or equal to 100, so that would be, and I'll just go ahead and draw an arrow so you can see how this box works. So that would have been everything to the right, greater than, right? In this one, y is greater than or equal to 80, the green one, we'll do that one in green, we want everything greater, so that would also be up. Okay, so that would then be up here. Our third one, x is less than or equal to 200, in orange right here. So if I have my line, I want everything to the left, that's going to be less than. And my fourth one, y is less than or equal to 170, in blue, that would be down. Less than or equal to 170 would be to shade down. And my final equation, y has to be greater than or equal to this stuff. So that would mean out this way, right? All the y's that are to the right are above it, which ends up being the common area in here. If I kept all my other shading, I would have other shading all around, but in this area here in gray is where every single line would have shading. So that is my common area. That is my feasible region. All right, great. Let us move on then. Let's add a little bit more. So let's try our third and final problem and see how that goes. So problem number three. The appliance barn has 2,400 cubic feet of storage space for refrigerators. So in this problem, what we're going to do is we're going to write our constraints, we'll graph them as we just did, and then we'll take it to the final step and we'll maximize our profit. Okay, so again, reading through this, I'd like to highlight everything that's important. The barn has 2,400 cubic feet of storage. That's a limitation, right? That is a, that is a constraint. I can't put any more than 2,400 cubic feet of material in the appliance barn, okay? So this is for refrigerators. Large refrigerators come in 60 foot, 60 cubic feet, sorry, packing crates, and small refrigerators come in 40 foot, 40 cubic foot crates. So Anytime I buy a big refrigerator, it's going to take up 60 cubic feet, and anytime I buy a small one, it's going to take up 40. And this is very similar to in the military when they were trying to pack the airplanes and the boats. You know, they had to consider how much space each item took up in order to maximize what they could put on the boat at a time. Then I have this second equation down here, the second or second set of information, I should say. It says a large refrigerator can be sold for $250 profit and smaller ones can be sold for $150 profit. Anytime I see this, I immediately think this is going to be my objective, this is going to be my profit equation. So I can ignore this for now. Okay, so this information here, I'm just going to ignore because it's not part of my constraints, right? This just has to do with profit. And it's really related to this equation down here, which we'll talk about in just a second. All right, so going back to our constraints, again, we always need to... Um, define our variables. So we said that X is going to be the number of large refrigerators and Y will be the number of small refrigerators. And there is one thing here that I didn't read, but at the very bottom it says at least 40 refrigerators must be sold each month. And that's going to be important because that is a constraint as well. So we'll highlight that. Okay, great. So let's write our constraints. Number one, and we'll write that right here. So number one, it says that the appliance barn has 2,400 cubic feet of storage and that each of these refrigerators take up 60 and 40. So let's look at this. So X is the number of large refrigerators and we know that for each of those, it takes up 60 cubic feet 
and for the number of small refrigerators y for each of those that's going to take up 40 cubic feet and the most that we have available is 2400 cubic feet so all the stuff we buy and put in there has to be less than or equal to that it has to fit in there okay I don't see any other constraints in this top part so if we skip down to here it says at least 40 refrigerators must be sold each month so there is our second constraint so the number of large ones plus the number of small ones has to be at least 40 right it could be 41 it could be 42 but whatever we have whatever we sell has to be at least so greater than or equal to 40 and those are our two constraints so let's go ahead and graph those before we do anything else. Let's do step two and graph them. So here's our constraints again, and we know that we're probably going to need to rewrite them in y equals mx plus b form. So let's go ahead and take this first one, 60x plus 40y. And I'm just going to leave it as equal to for now because I'm just going to be graphing the boundary line and I'll worry, worry about my shading later. So I'm going to subtract 60x from both sides. Okay, and I'm left with 40y on the left side is equal to negative 60x plus 2400. Almost done. I need to divide everything by 40. And we will come up with, I'm going to move that down. We'll come up with y is equal to, 40 divided by 40 goes away. And we'll go ahead and reduce this so the zeros can cancel. I still have the negative. 2 goes into 6 3 times, goes into 4 2 times, x plus, and then I'll reduce this as well so we can cancel a 0. 4 goes into 24 6 times, and into 0 0 times. So there's our first equation. And one thing I can do, I notice that my y-intercept is 60. So I could actually add a 0 to the 30 and add a 0 to the 20 because I think it'll be easier for me to do rise over run out of 10s versus out of 1s. My second equation, let's look at the second one now. Do that one in orange. We have x plus y is equal to 40. So all I need to do here is move the x over and then subtract x. And I get y is equal to negative x plus 40. And again, I'm looking at what my numbers are and I'm thinking that my scale is going to be out of 10. So instead of writing negative x plus 40, instead what I'm going to, going to do is change my slope, but leaving it is the same value. I can't change the value of it, but I could write it as y equals negative 10 over 10x plus 40. Negative 10 over 10 is still negative 1. So it still is my same original slope. Just like negative 30 over 20 is still negative 60 over 40, just reduced a little bit. Okay, now I'm ready to graph. Based on my numbers, I know that I am not going to go by ones. I think it would be easier to go by tens or go by fives. So maybe I'll go ahead and go by fives. So let's, I'm going to go ahead and mark the scale. So each one of these will be five. So I'm going to go ahead and do a 10 here and then a 20, 30, and I'll continue on labeling. And there's my x-axis. And remember that this was the small refrigerators. So now we'll go the other way. We'll do our y-axis as well. So we'll start off. Each of these, again, is going to be 5. So that's going to be 10. That's going to be 20 and 30 and so on. OK, so now I have everything labeled. I will graph my equations. So I have a plus 60 here, which is my y-intercept. So I'll put that there. We'll make that one be blue. And my slope is going to be a negative 30 over 20. So I'm going to go down 30, 10, 20, 30, and then over 20, 10, 20, and put my point. Okay, and from there, I can draw my boundary line.
And then let's go ahead and do the orange one. Okay, so our y-intercept is here at 40. So we'll put a point here at 40, and then our slope is negative 10 over 10. So we'll go down 10 to 30 and over 10 to 10. Okay, and maybe I'll do one more. We'll go down to 20 and we'll go over um, this way to 20 over here. And now we can draw our boundary line. So let's go ahead and do that. And we'll do an orange. Okay, so that's pretty good. And you want to try to get it as close as possible, obviously, so that you can pick up your boundary points. Okay, you don't really want to be off. Now, one thing that we didn't do, and I didn't mention it, was that we're dealing with real life material. So we automatically will have constraints here on the x axis and the y axis. So even though these lines would continue on in the mathematical world, we won't consider that. So the area that we consider will be, and I'll go ahead and do that in, um, let's do that in the pink here, will be in between here and, I'll draw this all the way down, here and here. So we won't consider anything outside of that. So if it happens to be that this triangle down here is our solution, we would look at here and here. If it's in between, we would consider here, here, and here. So let's figure out where we need to shade and that way we'll know. If I look at my first one, it says that y, and now this is where I need my sign, right? So my sign was less than or equal to, and I never flipped it because I never divided or multiplied by a negative. So I want all the y's that are less than or equal to this. So that would be down, right? That would be down here all the y's that are less than or equal to that. Okay, and notice that I'm stopping here at the orange because I wanna see which way the orange goes first. If the orange goes down, then I'll need to continue. But I'm gonna go ahead and stop here at the orange and see what the orange is doing. So my orange one says, and again, my sign was greater than, okay, and I didn't divide or multiply by a negative, so ultimately my final my final constraint is going to be greater than or equal to everything. So that means orange is going to shade up everything greater than or equal to. Okay, and that's what I thought. So I didn't want to have a bunch of extra shading on there because it would be difficult to locate our points and, and see what our common feasible area is. So we have some boundary points here, here, and it looks like I'm going to assume it's right here on the 40. Okay, and that's why it's good to do this by hand and really use a straight edge. So if we pull off our boundary points, we have 40 comma zero. Right over here, we are going to have, and we'll just put this down here, we have zero comma 40. And up here, we have zero comma 60. So we have three boundary points. And based on the lesson from last time, we know that we need to take each of these boundary points and test them in this equation. So like we did last time, the easiest thing is to go ahead and set up a table. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a table right here in order to test my three boundary lines. Okay. Okay, so I went ahead and drew in my table. And I have, remember, my x and my y and my p for profit. So I pulled off each of these three boundary vertices, right, in my feasible region here. And I've got 0, 40, 0, 60, and 40, 0. Now let's think about what we're looking for. So in the past, you looked for the maximum and the minimum. And we wanna figure out what it is that we're looking for here, because normally you don't look for both, usually you're just looking for one or the other. So if we go back to the problem, it says, large refrigerators can be sold for a $250 profit, which is where I got this. And remember, X was my large refrigerators. And the smaller ones can be sold for $150 profit, and that's my small. So this is my profit equation, and that's how I got that. How many of each type of refrigerator should be sold to maximize profit? So we are looking to maximize profit. Okay, and what is the maximum profit? We want to figure that out, which we will end up doing when we plug in our points. 
So we are trying to find the maximum. So let's go ahead and take our first point and plug it in. So we have P is equal to 250 times 0, right, x is 0, plus 150 times 4, 40, sorry, 40. Well, 250 times 0 is just 0, and then 150 times 40, we can use a calculator or we can think of what 15 times 40 is, and that's 60 plus the extra zeros, so that would be 6,000. Then let's do our second one. We have a 0, 40, so our profit here is going to be, and we know right away that 250 times 0 is just going to go away. It's going to be 0 plus 150. This time we have multiplying by 60, so we know it's going to be more. Uh, 150 times 60, we can do 15 times 60 and then add the two zeros. 15 times 60 is 90 plus two zeros. And then our final one, we have 40. Oops, I'm a little bit out of order here. So we are using the 40. And let's uh, put this back here. So we've got 250 times 40 plus 150 times 0. So that's going to go away. 250 times 40, I can do 25 times 4, which is 100, right, 4 quarters, and then add on the extra zeros. So that's 10,000, that's 9,000, that's 6,000. And you should be able to see that if we manufacture 40, of x, which is the small refrigerators, and zero of the large, we will actually have a profit of $10,000, and that would be in our best interest. And that's how businesses use this linear programming in order to help them in their businesses to know what to do. So this company might say, you know what, we are not going to worry about large refrigerators anymore. It's not in our best interest. Based on our constraints, we're just only going to manufacture the small. Now, if their constraints changed, they got a bigger warehouse, they got a bigger production facility, something like that, they would want to reanalyze their situation. Okay, and that ends our lesson today on linear programming. So have fun doing your practice.